What's up, everybody? It's Dr. Daniel Choi. It's been a long time. Um, I'm here on a Sunday actually filming a video for you guys because it's been so long, but uh, let's just jump right into it. We want to discuss a case where a patient had a dental implant placed in another country, and it was for his lower right first molar, and there was something I saw on the x-ray as to why I rec recommended removing the implant and starting all over. So I'm going to go over that case with you, kind of like how it happened, uh, what we're going to do about it and how we can prevent these issues and then at the end of this i'm going to show you another patient where something similarly was done they placed a crown on that tooth and several years later the patient ended up having issues with his implant and then lost that implant okay so um, let's jump jump right into this case here so we had this patient who's um, in his 40s he had this dental implant done in another country again for his lower right first molar and let me share this x-ray with you all right, so this is this um, the tooth number 30, this dental implant, his lower right first molar that he lost. And basically what I'm seeing right here is that we already see some bone loss occurring here, right? And so whenever we see dental implants having bone loss right from the get-go, like literally like a few months after placing the, the dental implant, then we sit there and say, all right, um, do we really want to be having issues right from the get-go? And I tell people it's kind of like this. Um, let's say, well, down here in Texas, we have foundation issues. The foundation is a necessary thing for your home, for the long-term stability of your home, the long-term prognosis of your home, right? So if you were told by your contractor, hey, we just poured the foundation, foundation um, we're already having issues with the foundation, what would you do? Would you continue to, to continue to build the house on top of that? Or would you say, you know what, let's pause, let's actually start all over, and then we'll start building from there, right? And so why this can be an issue, why some people that you need to actually avoid some people might sit there and say well let's actually just try treating the dental implant right from here this standpoint and just see what we, we could do from here well one of the issues is that if you try treating the dental implant treating an implant can be pretty unpredictable and because treating an implant in the unpredictable nature of it um, sometimes and basically in my mouth depending on how bad the issue is would i just rather just take out the dental implant do another bone graft and start over from scratch and this is a case-by-case -case basis, but in a case like this, I said, hey, you know, I explained to this patient, you already have bone loss kind of going on with this tooth. Um, I would highly recommend that you start over. Well, you know, obviously he was, um, you know, a little frustrated. He had this dental implant done a while back, um, you know, again, in another country. He's sitting, coming in, expecting to just put an abutment and crown on top of the tooth. Um, but now we are already having issues, right? And so... Um, after discussing more with him, I finally was able to convince him, hey, listen, in my mouth, with what I'm seeing on this x-ray right here, I would actually remove this dental implant. And why do I say that, right? And so the first factor I kind of loosely went over is that whenever you have dental implants, the dental implants have these tiny little microscopic pores in them, in the titanium, that allows the blood, when you, after you place a dental implant, the blood rushes in, um, engages with those little microscopic pores. And then when that blood has osteoblasts, which are bone forming cells, then start forming bone in your jaw and it interlocks with the little, those little microscopic pores, that's what creates the mechanical lock with that dental implant with your bone, right? And so I like to tell people that process of osteointegration, which is a technical term, but I like to tell people when that's happening, that's like waiting for concrete to kind of like interlock with something like a pole that you put into the ground. And so, Although that's great, the one issue is that those little microscopic pores that allow the blood to rush in, well, the problem is that's also a great nesting spot for bacteria to kind of seep in there and kind of hang out. And that's why it becomes very difficult that if you have bacteria in the microscopic pores of your dental implants, it becomes very difficult to basically go in there and clean all that out. And because of that, that can basically give us an unpredictable prognosis for the future of that dental implant. And so that was one thing, right? And so the other factor is basically, um, I discussed this in my Dental Implant 101 series videos, and I'm going to link it above, but I always talked about length of dental implant and the diameter of the implant, right? So long story short, the length and diameter of the implant will allow more surface area of the dental implant to engage with the bone, right? And so let me give a quick example. So Again, I, I will, I'll link the videos above and below. I would highly recommend you watch those dental 101 implant videos because you'll really understand kind of like the whole concept of why we do the things that we do when we're doing dental implants. Um, but similarly in an analogy, if I was to put up a pole that was supposed to support something um, and I bury it in the ground, am I gonna wanna bury it like several feet in the ground or am I gonna bury it like six inches in the ground? 
And that whole concept goes into the surface area of that with whatever is engaging with the soil or the concrete, right? So the more surface area I have with that hole engaging in the concrete or the soil, then I'm going to have much more stability, right? And so the same concept occurs with your dental implants. So with your dental implants, I want more short, more surface area. And again, in those videos I talked about, they, we talk about bone implant contact, right? So however much implant is in contact with the bone, then the more stability we're going to have with this dental implant. Well, what ends up happening is that as we're chewing and we're biting down, we're putting tons of forces, right? And then some people like to even clench or grind. And grinding is even the worst because you're putting those lateral forces across your teeth and where bedental implants really don't like those lateral forces. But uh, what ends up happening is your dental implant can experience failure. And I actually had a patient who came in uh, recently who had a dental implant placed 10 years ago. And he says he has a tendency to grind a lot. And what ended up happening was that he lost bone and now he's going to lose his dental implant, right? So long story short, your body doesn't like, your dental implants don't like when you do a lot of that grinding motion. Well, one thing that can really help a dental implant, even if you're a grinder or clencher or just chewing on that area a lot, is that you need to have that dental implant have more bone implant contact, so more surface area. So long story short, what that means is we need to place as long of a dental implant as we can and as wide of a dental implant as we can. But if you again watch my dental implant 101 videos, we talk about certain anatomy that we need to watch out for. So whenever we're talking about this case, this patient specifically, whoever the surgeon was that placed his dental implant, they were trying to avoid something called the inferior alveolar nerve. And so the inferior alveolar nerve runs on each side of our jaw. And what it does is it innervates um, basically our lip area and the mental area, um, also innervates all our teeth. And so you have this nerve running on each side. And so you could see that this nerve is kind of running a little bit close to the um, inferior alveolar nerve and where it exits into the tissue called a mental nerve. But unfortunately, I'm logging in remotely to my grapevine office and my CBCTs aren't loading. I would love to share with you guys basically how this patient had adequate thick bone. You know, yeah, we're getting a little bit close to the nerve, but I think that this patient could have had a little bit longer of an implant, but definitely a much wider implant. Now, we don't want to go too wide of an implant. Again, I discussed in the Dental Implant 101 videos that um, if you exceed a certain width and you only have a certain amount of buckle bone, outer edge bone, and it's too thin on that outer edge, then what can happen is that you can start experiencing other issues later on down the road, such as periimplantitis, right? So there's a fine balance between how long and wide of an implant that you want to place um, you don't want to go too huge because, again, too long can damage um, certain structures such as nerves and too wide can cause other issues that can cause the bone to be lost and to experience future dental implant issues, long story short. And so um, I want to show you that. So basically, I had this, uh, you know, I, I discussed exactly what I just discussed with you guys, right? And as I explained to him, listen, with everything that I see right now, again, I don't like how we've already lost several millimeters of bone on this dental implant because now we only have a few millimeters left. Uh, we could treat the dental implant. Um, again, that can be a little bit unpredictable at times also. And if it's not going to get, um, if we're not going to get further bone growth and worst case scenario, we could even lose more bone. Um, but with how much surface area that we have with this dental implant in contact with your, you know, with your bone, in my mouth, I would actually take out this implant. So I was able to talk him into it, right, to remove that dental implant. But let's take a close-up look at what I saw. Now, if you're squeamish, I would recommend that you just kind of fast forward through this area, but I'm just going to actually show you guys an image um, with our um, camera of what it looked like after we took off that temporary crown, made incision in the gum, and you can actually see the dental implant. So here it is. So here's a photo of when I basically, you know, again, pulled the gums back and you could see that the patient has about four millimeters of bone loss. So that's what the marking right there would say. And this is what we call circumferential defect. And so the patient has bone loss going around all of the implant. And so this implant is actually only a 10 millimeter implant. Um, and so to lose like about four millimeters of bone all around the dental implant. So you can say that this patient has lost about 40% of his bone already. Um, around the dental implant. So, um, you know, I take a look at this uh, this photo and I'm sitting here thinking, you know, why didn't they, you know, the, you know, place an implant that was a little bit longer? And also we have plenty of thickness of this bone ridge that this patient could have had a, a, a much wider dental implant, given us more surface area with that dental implant um, to the bone. 
and um, just made it better for the patient's long-term prognosis. So long story short, what did I do? So again, we removed that dental implant. We um, were able to use a very fine uh, needle burr, go around the dental implant, elevate that implant out, and did a bone graft. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna wait several months, let that bone all integrate, and we're gonna then place a more properly sized implant in that area. Again, we're gonna look at our 3D scans and make sure that we place a proper dental implant in for that area, which again is a first molar. That's gonna take a lot of abuse because you're chewing on that tooth primarily within your mouth. Again, your first molars are a primary chewing tooth. And um, again, we're trying to also account if this patient has any clenching or grinding habits. And this, the, the other thing about this guy, obviously I'm gonna you know, protect you know, his identity, but he's got big masseters, big jaws, and like again, guys like this, um, that can put down lots of chewing force on these dental implants. Um, you again want to make sure you have as much bone implant contact. So again, what we were able to do for this patient, uh, make sure that he's not going to have any future issues, uh, potentially losing an implant, and investing more money into this abutment and crown. Um, and so we're, that's, that's basically what we did for this patient. Now let me give you another example of another patient, um, just to give you a little background story on this guy. Um, similar guy in his 30s, um, big jaws, uh, you know, puts, you could tell by his master muscles, he has a lot of chewing force and put a lot of force down on his teeth. Well, the, this patient had the similar tooth, it's just the other tooth on the other edge, tooth number 19, his lower first molar, that he had a dental implant placed about four years ago with an oral surgeon in another city around DFW. And what ended up happening is that um, he started having discomfort in this area. We took some x-rays and let me show them to you guys real quick. All right, so this is his dental implant, tooth number 19. And again, I talked earlier that one of the things that we're looking out for is that we want to place as long of an implant as possible and as wide of an implant as possible. But look where his nerve is right here. I mean, so that's basically our main threat. We do not want to penetrate to this area. But what they did was they placed a Nobel Active, um, which I'm not a big fan of that implant um, because I, I have seen a lot of issues with that implant uh, whenever I placed them way back in the day. Um, but this, this dental implant, they used a 3.75 diameter dental implant, 10 millimeters in length in this area. And again, I wish I could really show your CB, show here, share his CBCT scan, um, that he has plenty of thickness of bone in that area. And as you saw on this x-ray, he has plenty of distance, like, you know, about 20 millimeters from the, the edge of the bone to his nerve that they could have placed a much longer implant and they could have placed a much wider implant. But unfortunately, um, you know, this patient invested in the extraction, bone grafting, an implant, abutment, a crown, and put all that money into it. And here he is sitting years later having issues with it. Now, how were we able to tell that he was having issues? So he was basically saying that um, he had some discomfort in the area. So we took a closer up x-ray. This is what we could see here. So we could see a little bit of a, what we call a radiolucency, like a darkening around the dental implant, which can give us an idea that there's something happening with the implant. And here's another view of the dental implant with the crown off and a healing abutment on there. So what ended up happening for this patient is that um, the, he actually went back to the oral surgeon. It was actually a little bit of an interesting story. I told him basically what I saw, what I thought was happening with the dental implant. He went back to his oral surgeon. He was obviously a little bit upset. Um, he was discussing with his oral surgeon, hey, like I had this dental implant done, like what, what's going on here? Um, and so his dentist oral surgeon was a little reluctant to take care of the case, but then eventually did take care of the case. So, you know, like luckily, you know, you know, I'm glad for the patient, but um, not to throw anybody under the bus, but I really believe that this case could have been, this issue could have been prevented if they used a long enough implant, again, the only thing that they really had to avoid is hitting the inferior alveolar nerve. And also his bone was very thick. So there was really no reason why they couldn't use, couldn't have used maybe like a 5.5 .5 diameter implant, five diameter, five millimeter implant, even a four and a half millimeter diameter implant um, with a 13 millimeter length implant, which would have given so much more surface area with that dental implant in contact with the jaw bone, which would have given more bone implant contact that potentially could have saved this dental implant. And so something to look out for, and we're all guilty of it, right? Because one of our main fears when we're placing dental implants is we don't want to damage your nerves, right? So why would we want to excessively place uh, as long of an implant that's getting encroaching close upon the nerve, right? So 
that's one thing that we want to avoid. And then there's also studies that show that, hey, if you have in your lower jawbone, because it's so dense, you know, if you get away with a 10 millimeter implant, you'll be fine with that. But that doesn't cover all cases. You know, I've placed over 10,000 implants in my career, you know, placing literally um, like 250 implants a month. Um, um, so the implant count has extremely gone up again because we do a lot of all on fours too. But what I'm saying is that, you know, Although we could get away with an implant like that in most cases, you just never know what patient's going to be a clencher or a grinder or just chewing a lot on that area. So it just makes more sense that the patient has enough, you know, um, bone thickness and also distance away from the sinus or the, like the, the nerves or some other vital anatomy that the patient should get as long and thick of an implant as possible to give us that bone implant contact to really give the longest, the, the best prognosis for this dental implant. So um, I just wanted to share this case in regards to like what can happen sometimes. So this patient was going to lose their implant and had to start over and get another implant. I um, haven't seen this patient for a while, but I just wanted to share these cases with you guys in regards to why dental implant sizing can really, really, really matter for patients. And um, if you see cases like this, kind of like what the thought process is and um, what to kind of do about them. So. Hopefully this information was helpful for you guys. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below. Um, I love reading the comments. And um, if you guys have any other questions, please feel free to hit me up. All right, thanks. I'll see you guys later.